So, so welcome to the new, uh, the new lecture theatre at the Oxford Martin School, recently renovated with state-of-the-art uh, audiovisual equipment, which we won't be using tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the second of Professor Tim Scanlon's You Hero Lectures, uh, When Does Equality Matter? Um, Professor Scanlon will speak for uh, sort of under 50, 55 minutes, and then we'll have an hour for question. He will give a short recap at the beginning, and tonight's lecture is entitled Equal Status. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming back, or thanks for coming, as the case may be. Um, uh, on Thursday, I uh, announced my thesis that inequality isn't bad in itself. That is, the mere fact that, two, that people in two different places uh, live at different uh, levels of, of well-being isn't itself a reason to try to reduce the difference between them, as opposed to uh, perhaps a reason to make the worse off uh, better off. Uh, that uh, there are objections to inequality, that, are, that is to say objections to the difference between uh, how some people fare and how others fare, but these objections are all specific and depend upon some background uh, connection. They either depend on the consequences for the individuals of the fact that there is this difference between how well, some are, how well off some are and how well off others are, or they depend on some institutional framework or background of obligation. I considered several obligations to inequality, three of them based on, on uh, its causes. Uh, I've I considered the possibility that inequality can be objectionable because the difference between the way some people live and the way other people live gives rise to objectionable feelings of, of loss of status and inferiority. Um, it can be objectionable because the difference in people's economic uh, status, for example, allows some of them to objectionably control the lives of others. Uh, or it can be objectionable uh, because it undermines the fairness of important institutions. Great economic uh, inequality, as we have seen, can undermine or threaten the fairness of our political institutions and also threaten uh, equality of opportunity. Uh, I considered a further uh, possibility uh, that, that inequality can be objectionable, not because of its consequences, uh, but because uh, it violates an idea of uh, obligation of equal treatment on the part of some agent who owes a duty of care uh, to all the people and therefore owes, owes them, uh, is under a requirement that he or she should respond to the reasons given by this obligation uh, in, in an equal way. And finally, I considered a different class of claims uh, to, to equality uh, which, and objections to inequality, which arise from the fact that people in a group uh, may have equal claims to certain resources, uh, and therefore it's an objection to institutions that distribute those resources if they uh, don't distribute them equally, at least prima facie, although there may be justifiable departures uh, from that. I left open the possibility uh, that there are other objections of, of a specific sort to inequality, and indeed I welcome any suggestions along this line since that's essential to uh, carrying out my project. One challenge for that project uh, is, is to find a sufficient list of specific obligations uh, to inequality such that every case where inequality, that is the difference between what some people have and what other people have, seems objectionable, that objectionable character can be accounted for by some one or some combination of the things on the list, right? There's no way of, of refuting the idea that inequality is simply bad in itself, uh, except by thinking it doesn't seem to be very plausible. There seem to be some counterexamples to it, but still maybe it is, maybe it is true, but the, the, the object is to find a list of more specific objections that seem to cover the territory and account uh, account for all, all of the uh, examples. A second problem in carrying out this project is to, is to work out the content of the particular uh, objections to inequality uh, that are on that list. And today's lecture will be devoted to some thoughts uh, by way of an examination of the objection I called uh, objections to inequality based on unequal, unequal status. And tomorrow, I will try to do the same thing for the idea of objections to inequality based on the fact that they undermine equality of opportunity. So in today's lecture, I will first uh, try to examine uh, the objections that seem to strike us intuitively to uh, glaring kinds of inequality such as caste systems, hereditary class systems, and systems of racial or ethnic uh, discrimination. 
then there will be a brief digression on the idea of desert, since it might seem within these systems for people who hold that view that being born into a uh, particular place in society uh, is a ground why you deserve to be treated in a certain way or don't deserve to be treated in some other way. So there's going to be a little digression uh, on, on desert. Then I will consider how it is that economic inequality might be thought to produce effects that are objectionable for similar sorts of reasons. Uh, third, I will then consider uh, whether a fully meritocratic society, should we achieve one, might in fact turn out to be objectionable for at least some of the, of the reasons for which we found a caste or class or hierarchical society uh, objectionable. Uh, and then finally, I will consider some ways of avoiding uh, the, the, the problems that might arise in a meritocratic uh, society and look at a couple of their applications. Okay, that's, uh, that's my project uh, for, for today. So what then seems to us to be wrong with caste and class societies and societies marked by racial discrimination? In such societies, peop some people are denied access to valued forms of employment and other positions simply on the grounds of their birth. They are often also denied basic political rights, such as the right to vote, participate in politics, and so on. But in addition, they are viewed as ineligible for what I will call associational goods, at least in relation to people outside of their group. That is to say, they're seen as less eligible or ineligible as potential friends, possible marriage partners, uh, uh, possible sons and daughters-in-law, uh, and even neighbors. These discriminatory attitudes have some similarity to moral blame, which in my view can also involve a denial of such associational goods. If you blame a person for behaving very badly, that can be a, that can be a reason not to want to be the person's friend, not to want to uh, marry the person or have your son and daughter-in-law do, or not to want to enter into relations of trust and cooperation with them, uh, and, 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 and so on. Now, what's the difference? Well, the difference, we might say, is that when a person is blameworthy, the denial of associational goods is justified. But in cases of discrimination of the kind I'm considering, it's, it is seen as justified by the people in the society in question, but it's not in fact justified. And this seems to me correct. But I think it's also seen as justified in a particular way, which is like the case of desert. That is, it's seen as justified because deserved. And the idea of desert is often invoked in discussions of inequality. In my view, often invoked in ways that are invalid. So as a pre pre precursor to that, it's worth making a brief digression at this point to say how I think this notion of desert should be understood. This will help, at least I hope it will help, later in my lecture to understand how the idea of desert makes illicit appearance at various points in our discussions of inequality. Following Joel Feinberg, I hold that a desert-based justification for treating a person in a particular way is a justification which claims that that treatment is made appropriate simply by certain facts about what that person is like or what he or she has done. More specifically, that what the person is like or what he or she has done exhibits some particular kind of merit. The simply in this formulation is intended to exclude justifications that appeal to the effects of treating the person in that way and to justifications that appeal to the fact that this treatment is called for by some institution, which is itself justified on some basis other than an appeal to desert. So, for example, to discipline a child by depriving him of a treat because he deserves it is a different thing from doing this because this will, as one supposes, improve his character or make him likely to behave better uh, in the future. Claiming that people who have worked hard all their lives deserve a good pension is also different from claiming that they are entitled to pension benefits according to the regulations of the security, social security system or to some, or to some pension system of their, of their employer. I believe that there are valid desert-based justifications for some forms of treatment. For example, I believe that the attitudes that are involved in moral blame, including suspension or modification of associational goods, such as friendship, can be justified purely on the basis of desert. These responses can be made appropriate simply by facts about what the person is, what the person has done or is like, specifically about the non-meritorious character of the person's attitudes toward others. I would add that in order for this to be the case, it's not necessary that these facts about the person, what Feinberg called the desert base, are themselves deserved. It's not necessary that the person deserves to have or is responsible for having the attitudes that make him or her blameworthy. 
as Feinberg said very clearly and obviously correctly, I think, a dessert basis need not be itself deserved. Although I believe that dessert-based justifications are sometimes valid, I do not believe that economic inequalities can be justified in this way. The fact that a person has a scarce talent for which there is demand in the market doesn't itself make it appropriate for that person to have more money than others do. This is not because people don't deserve the talents they have or because, as Rawls puts it, they do not deserve their place in the distribution of natural assets, that is, do not deserve that their talent should be scarce. I agree that people do not deserve these things, but as I've said, a dessert base need not be itself deserved. So the point is not that no one deserves his place in the distribution of natural assets, but rather just that having a particular place in that distribution, a particular scarce talent, say, does not itself, in itself, make greater economic reward appropriate. Which is not to say that such a reward might not be derivatively justified by the fact that an institution that calls for such rewards might be justified for other reasons. For example, because it's efficient and is just. The difference between blame and economic rewards is this. There is, as it were, an internal relation between blaming responses, such as the withdrawal of friendly feelings and suspension or modification of associational goods, and the blameworthy actions and attitudes that make these responses appropriate. This connection lies in the fact that the attitudes that are modified when we blame someone are owed to others only conditionally upon attitudes and behaviors that the blameworthy person is shown to lack. But there is, in general, no similar internal relation between particular kinds of economic activity and differential amounts of monetary compensation, comp compensation that these activities made appropriate. I say in general because sub sorry I say in general because this is a substantive claim that has to be justified on a case by case basis. What seem to be such connections in cases, I believe, are purely conventional. The same is true, I think, in the case of criminal punishment. Theft may deserve condemnation and withdrawal of trust. That's, a, that's, an, that's because punishment is an instance of blame, which condemns the act. But, but, but theft does not in itself make appropriate any particular criminal penalty. Whether theft calls for imprisonment, fine, or the cutting off of hands is purely a matter of convention. If such a convention is justified, as some of the ones I've listed aren't, um, th then this may make the punishment or reward that that institution calls for justified as well. But it is no part of the justification for such institutions that they assign the punishments or economic rewards that people actually deserve. To say that these judgments of desert are based on social convention, the ones, the substantive judgments that people make, that, th that thieves ought to have their hands cut off or ought to go to prison rather than, uh, rather than be fined or put under house arrest or whatever. Um, to say that these judgments of desert are based on social convention is not to deny that they are firmly felt and seen as important by those who make them. But they do not, in fact, carry any normative weight, I believe. I will return to this point tendentiously, tendentious, tendentiously at the end of my lecture. To return then to my main topic, the denial of rights, opportunities, and associational goods involved in the forms of discrimination I started off by describing is undeserved, but it is seen as deserved in the sense I've defined, that is seen as made appropriate simply by facts about what those discriminated against are like, such as, for example, the color of their skin or their religion or the class or country into which they were born. Because the goods that are denied to such people are important goods, it is seen in such a society as a misfortune to be born into one of these groups. This is seen as a misfortune because it entails a supposedly justified lack of things that one has good reason to want. Is it an, is it an additional point that the members of these groups are seen as inferior? This inferiority would seem to consist in the view that others are justifiably preferred to them for various roles and associational goods, that one, that one is less suitable for these than others are. So it seems that the basic inequality, in at least some of these cases, is not that one has less of some, what, some good, but that one is seen as, as less suited to have such goods than others are. So one egalitarian idea that seems to lie at the base of our objections to discrimination of these kinds is that no one is less entitled than others uh, to these important goods simply on the basis of characteristics such as those I have listed. 
This is not because everyone is equally entitled to these goods. Perhaps the blameworthy are not so entitled, and maybe entitlement varies for other reasons. Nor is it because these characteristics, such as race or the class into which one is born, are not th themselves deserved or are beyond the control of those who have them. A desert basis, as I've said, need not itself be deserved. The objection is just that these characteristics do not make these differences in treatment appropriate. An additional form of inferiority would be involved if the members of a lesser group were required by law or social custom to defer to members of the superior group in some way, by bowing, say, or standing aside when passing on the street, or by the use of special titles and distinct forms of address. But something like this can also be involved if the time of members of one group is seen as less valuable than that of others. They may be required to do things that are seen as a waste of the time of their betters or in some way inappropriate to those of higher status. It used to be said that someone once came upon Abraham Lincoln in the White House cleaning his own boots and said, Mr. President, do you clean your own boots? To which Lincoln was said to have replied, of course, whose boots did you think I cleaned? <laughs> the, the, idea, the idea behind the joke, whether it probably apocryphal, being that cleaning shoes was something beneath a person of Lincoln's sta sta status. A related and more familiar phenomenon uh, is that the time of members of one group may consistently be given priority over that of the other group in scheduling. The implication being that the time, the work, the leisure, and the convenience of members of the latter group is less important. This seems open to a purely egalitarian objection. It is objectionable because it might be said as incompatible with people seeing each other uh, as equals. You don't have to have a caste society in order to have that kind of inequality. A situation of the kind I've been describing is made worse if the members of the group that's discriminated against come to hold these attitudes toward themselves. They would, they would thus suffer a blow to their self-respect or self-esteem esteem, in the sense that Rawls speaks of in, in this passage. He says it describes it as a person's sense of his own value, his secure conviction that his conception of the good, his plan of life is worth carrying out, and a confidence in his ability so far it is within his power uh, to fulfill these intentions. But a feeling of inferiority or loss of self-esteem of this kind is not essential to the objection I'm considering. It's enough for this objection to apply that most people in a society hold these views of superiority and inferiority, with the result that the practices of exclusion and preference I've described exist and are stable. It is conceivable, and no doubt has occurred historically, that individuals may, as it were, come to affirm the roles and associational values of their status, and find self-respect in the sense that Rawls uh, just defined in the passage I quoted, in fulfilling these values and roles. There may be something good about this. It avoids the sense of humiliation that I described earlier. But this doesn't make the inequality involved completely unobjectionable on the grounds that I am presently concerned with. They remain denied unjustifiably of important social and associational goods. Whether members of a group that is discriminated against experience this as a blow to their self-respect and self-esteem or, or instead find self-respect and self-esteem in the fulfillment of the roles assigned them, it is likely that members of the groups that are not discriminated against in this way will see the fact that they do not have the characteristics of this group as a particularly important fact about them and a bulwark of their self-respect, a reason for thinking that their lives are worthwhile and their projects are worth pursuing. There is, there is thus likely to be a pathology of attitudes on both sides, the pathology being that of valuing or disvaluing one's life and activities for inappropriate reasons, and governing one's attitude and behavior toward others by these same mistaken reasons. So social practices of the kind I've been describing may be subject to three levels of objection. First, many individuals are barred from important goods and opportunities for no good reason. Second, both those who discriminate and those who are discriminated against are deprived of the important relational good of being able to relate to each other as equals. Third, many of the individuals in such a society are led to value or disvalue their lives and activities for reasons that are not good reasons. Those in the superior group may base their sense of worth falsely on this superior status. Those who are held to be inferior, if they accept this judgment, inappropriately disvalue themselves and their activities. 
If those who are discriminated against embrace their sense of worth, on, sorry, base their sense of worth on fulfilling the roles they're assigned as the only ones appropriate to them given what they are, this, they base this positive valuation on false reasons. The first of these objections is a charge of injustice, a claim about the right that certain goods are denied to people on no good, for no good reason. The last is a charge of misplaced valuation, a claim about the good. Insofar as the phenomenon that makes the first objection hold depends on the latter error being prevalent, this is a case in which there is a kind of dependence of the right on the good. I will return to this point later in my lecture. Now, how does the leveling down objection that I discussed in my last lecture, or the charge that egalitarianism is founded on envy, apply to this objection to inequality, this objection to unequal status? Being denied the goods I've mentioned, for no good reason, is something to object to, not mere envy of what others have. Does this provide a reason for leveling down? Well, what would leveling down consist in? If it would just involve eliminating the distinctions in status, changing laws or social attitudes so that no one is excluded from office, employment, or associational goods for no good reason, then leveling down seems totally justified. This would deprive some people of something that they value, but not something that they could complain of losing. Leveling down seems puzzling and counterintuitive if we start with some assume, assumed metric of how well off people are and interpret an objection to inequality as claiming that difference in levels measured by this metric are objectionable and then ask how reducing such differences could be a good thing if at least one party is left worse off as measured by this metric and neither is made better off by that metric. The answer then needs to be that the metric in question isn't capturing all of, of the relevant considerations. If we say that it doesn't capture all of the ways in which individuals are made better or worse off, then the case ceases to be one of leveling down, since the worse off are made better off in some way by this change. Rawls's strategy of counting the social bases as se of self-respect as part of his index of primary social goods is an index of this, right? If you eliminate factors that, that interfere with people's self-respect, then you've made them th the worse off better off in, in that important respect. Alternatively, we might say that this metric of well-being doesn't capture all of the considerations that bear on the question of whether a social state of affairs should be accepted. We might say, for example, that certain inequalities are unjust, even if they make everyone better off, as Jerry Cohen said might be true of some incentives. This opens up a conflict between justice on the one hand and well-being on the other. The present argument is different because it doesn't start from an from an objection to the difference between what some have and what others have as measured by some metric. It's not that the good of status is unequally distributed, as I've described the problem, or even that some people have more associational goods than others. But rather, the problem is that some are seen as less worthy of such goods and of certain other goods than others are. It is this underlying judgment assumed to be widely held in the society that is objectionable in itself on egalitarian grounds. This prevailing attitude produces a distribution of other goods that ought to be changed, but the change isn't justified solely on the ground that it reduces the difference between different individuals' enjoyment of some set of goods. As I noted in my first lecture, I believe we should question here the role that the idea of well-being is playing, and that's what I've just tried to do. The leveling down objection is most challenging if put in the form how can there be anything to be said for eliminating inequality if the resulting situation is one that the parties involved have no reason to prefer to the prior situation of inequality? A response to this objection in a given case needs to show that it's not in fact of this form by identifying the reasons that the parties involved, or at least some of them have, for preferring the more equal situation to the less equal one and making plausible the claim that there are good reasons not for, that these are good reasons, not for example, mere envy. But in order to do this, it's not necessary to cash these reasons out in terms of well-being. Let me turn now to the idea that economic inequality can lead to objectionable inequality in status. As Adam Smith suggested when he said in the passage I quoted in my first lecture, that is, it is an objection to economic conditions if they make it the case that some individuals cannot go out in public without shame. We need to look more closely at how economic inequality can produce objectionable effects of this kind. The mechanism through which this happens, I take it, is this. 
The ways that individuals dress, how they live, what they own or can consume, what kind of car they drive, for example, or whether they even have a car, or whether they have a computer, may mark them as eligible or ineligible for certain roles, and particularly more or less eligible for important, so, uh, for important associational goods of the kind I've mentioned. Since people's access to these things depends on the amounts of money they have, economic inequality can have effects of this kind. These effects are acutely described by Ji Wei Chi in his recent paper, Agency and Other Stakes of Poverty. This was in the Journal of Political Philosophy in this uh, year, 2013. Chi distinguishes what he calls three stakes of poverty, by which he means, I think, three ways in which it can be a bad thing for a person to be poor. Subsistence poverty occurs when the lack of money threatens a person's ability to meet the needs of physical survival. Status poverty occurs when lack of money makes it impossible for a person to live in the way that's required in his or her society in order to be respected. Agency po poverty occurs when a person's lack of money makes it impossible for him or her to function in the way that's required in, her, in his or her society to be a normal functioning agent. This is what is required in order to have self-respect in something like the terms in which Rawls defines it a secure sense of the worth of one's life plan, and at least minimal ability to carry out such a plan. To have a job, for example, in a society in which any responsible adult is expected to be employable. In our societies, avoiding agency poverty may involve such things as having a credit card, an address, a telephone, or perhaps an email address, I don't know, access to internet. All these things make it, make it difficult for you to function effectively uh, in, in a society. As Chi points out, these three stakes of poverty are separable. An ascetic who endures subsistence poverty by choice need feel no loss of agency, nor of status. Ascetics may be admired and seen as more, uh, more than usually comp competent individuals. In Mao's China, Chi says, subsistence poverty didn't convey lack of status at all. Rather, it marked a person as a particularly committed participant in the communist struggle uh, for a better China. And being wealthier might bring suspicion and stigma. In today's China, by contrast, he says, having a car is an important status symbol, and living like a peasant marks a person for disrespect and exclusion from what I'm calling associational goods. Similarly, one can experience status poverty while still having the full feeling of a functioning agent, having a job, participating in the economy as a consumer, being a parent, and so on, even though you're discriminated against in some other ways. To illustrate this point in an American context, in a recent weblog post, an African-American woman responded uh, to another uh, online commentator who, who criticized poor people because they wasted money on luxury goods, such as iPhones. She described how her mother's appearing in recognizable designer clothes with a designer handbag enabled her to get welfare payments restored for the granddaughter of her neighbor after her neighbor had simply been turned away at the welfare office on repeated visits. This is not, she wrote, um, the, the, the poster wrote, this is not a matter of being presentable, i.e. clean and not smelling in clothes that are not ragged, but rather looking like someone, like a person who needs to be treated with respect. The writer's point, I believe, is just that for a person who is poor, especially a black person, having certain luxury goods is crucial to avoid what she calls status poverty and agency poverty, crucial to being able to function well in the society. These ideas also capture what I think Adam Smith must have had in mind in the passage I quoted. The shame that he says is occasioned by poverty consists first of the sense that others see one, and perhaps one even sees oneself, as ineligible or less eligible than others for valued roles and associational goods. And second, it consists in being unable to function effectively as a normal agent in one's society. This can cause a sense that one is a person others have reason not to want to associate with, and a sense of failure in one's life. I said earlier in discussing discrimination and caste systems that the harms that these systems cause are good reasons for leveling down by eliminating the positions of privilege. If economic inequalities cause similar harms, then these provide a reason, these harms provide a reason, albeit maybe not a, always a conclusive reason, for preferring a situation without these economic inequalities, even if this lowers the economic well-being of some or, all, or even all. But the harms of status poverty and agency poverty result from economic inequality only given certain prevailing attitudes, 
So what these harms provide most directly is a reason for changing those attitudes, if that were possible. Even, the even, the distribution of economic even, even if the distribution of economic advantages were left unchanged, if feeling superior to others is one of the reasons for desiring wealth and income, at least beyond a certain point, then this change in attitudes would take something away from the better off, as in my st status example of a status society. If you change the attitude, some people are deprived of their feelings of, of self-respect based on status. But, as I said in that case, this isn't a loss they have any claim to object to. I'm not certain how much weight this argument bears, but it seems to me an interesting mirror image of the familiar charge of envy. The charge of envy is an objection to calls for reducing inequality on the ground that these merely express unjustifiable desires that others not have more than you do. What I've just described, by contrast, is an, objection, is an objection to resistance to eliminating inequality, on the ground that this resistance merely expresses an unjustifiable desire to have more than others do. This brings me back to the point I made earlier about the interrelation of the right and the good. The social attitudes that mediate between economic inequality on the one hand and status harms on the other consist, as I said earlier, in widespread evaluative error. People attach importance to differences in income and forms of consumption that those differences do not, in fact, have. The way of avoiding status harms that I just mentioned would consist in correcting these evaluative errors, if such a thing were possible. I doubt that it is always possible, or even often. But let me imagine for a moment a society in which at least some of these errors are corrected. Here I take off from a remark of Tom Nagel's near the end of his paper on affirmative action, where he writes, When racial and sexual injustice have been reduced, we shall still be left with the great injustice of the smart and the dumb, who are so differently rewarded for comparable effort. Nagel mentions differences in economic reward for comparable effort doled out to the smart and the dumb. But I think he also has clearly in mind differences in esteem, and this is what I want to focus on. So imagine a society, if you can, where there's no discrimination on grounds of race, sex, or other accidents of birth, aside, that is, uh, from the accidents of talent. There are, I will assume, some offices and positions that everyone in the society regards as particularly desirable to hold. This is not just, I'm assuming, because of the economic rewards attached to them, and if I wanted to go even farther into an unreal assumption, I might even assume that these economic differences are modest or even non-existent. They aren't essential to the point I'm trying to make, although I think they may be a kind of distorting feature in our thinking about examples of the kind I'm trying to, trying to describe. I'm supposing just that these positions are seen as desirable because of the opportunities they offer to exercise developed talents in a valuable way and to engage in, in more, enjoyable and, uh, more enjoyable and valuable forms of activity. It may also be because these positions, these positions may also be desirable because they constitute recognition that those who qualify for them are, along various important dimensions, more successful than others in achieving personal goods more successful in achieving forms of accomplishment and success that everyone, forms of accomplishment and success that everyone has reason to desire. Now I'm assuming that people are selected for these positions purely on the basis of their merit, with no discrimination or favoritism, and that this is believed to be the case uh, by everyone in the society. One might even say that it's true and believed to be true that the people who occupy, by these, occupy these positions deserve them. This will be so at least in the institutional sense. The institutions that involve these positions are justified, and if people are assigned to the positions on the basis that these institutions specify. But insofar as the positions constitute an appropriate recognition for certain forms of excellence, there might be said to be, they might be said to be deserved in the deeper pre-institutional sense that I discussed earlier. Those who occupy these positions have characteristics that in themselves make this form of recognition appropriate. I, what I was denying earlier was that, that these characteristics would make extra monetary compensation appropriate. Now my question is whether status harms of the kind I discussed earlier would nonetheless continue to occur in a society of the kind I'm t describing. Wouldn't a thoroughly, I mean really thoroughly meritocratic society have many of the faults of a caste society? There would of course be some mobility that's lacking in a caste society. 
there would be a possibility for talented children of any class to move up to more desirable positions. And everyone in society will, I assume, believe that it's a good thing to have talents that qualify one for these positions and a misfortune to lack them. All parents, for example, will have reason to want their children to have their talents and hence to, have to be able to, as I just put it, move up. But how much difference should this possibility of mobility uh, make in our thinking about, this, about, about the society? Why don't the attitudes, widely shared, that the better positions are ones that everybody should aspire to and feel sorry not to be qualified for, why shouldn't that constitute a kind of hierarchy? As many of you will recognize, this is the question raised long ago by the British sociologist Michael Young in his famous dystopian uh, comedy, The Rise of the Meritocracy. Um, if you haven't read it, I recommend it, although it, it doesn't seem as funny as it did <laughs> then, and it seems very long and labored, <laughs> but you can get the point pretty quickly. <laughs> You've got the point, <laughs> but, but he elaborates it in, a, in an amusing and, and, and interesting and, 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 powerful, and powerful way. The attitudes that prevail in the, in the imagined uh, meritocratic society I'm discussing do not, I'm assuming, involve any kind of evaluative error of the sort I mentioned earlier. But even if they do not, or especially if they do not, won't those who lack these talents feel a justified lack of status? How could such a feeling be avoided? Can we recognize that certain talents are very much worth developing, that we all have reason to try to develop them in ourselves and for our children, and that social roles and positions that allow people to exercise these talents for the benefit of all of us are quite justified, without at the same time endorsing a society in which some people will feel justified and objectionable lack of status and self-esteem. Rousseau responded to this dilemma by rejecting the first premise. He held that people valued special accomplishments only as a way of feeling superior to others. So there would be nothing lost in giving these up if we could do so, although he thought we couldn't. Right? That would be a, f a form of the kind of leveling down that I mentioned. But I, don't, but I believe that such evaluative attitudes can be justified. Some forms of accomplishment are worth striving for, for feeling good about if we attain them, and for feeling regret if we do not. So I have to face the question of how objectionable effects of the kind I've been described might be avoided, or whether they must simply be accepted as facts of life. I will consider, in, in closing here, two uh, proposals, uh, two recent proposals, about how these effects might be minimized uh, or avoided. The first route is a version of Michael Walzer's idea in Spheres of Justice, that what justice requires is that each good should be distributed on the terms appropriate to it, rather than be dominated or controlled by the distribution of some other good. It's unjust, he wrote, if one good, say money, can command others, other goods, such as love, honor, or political office, goods which should be distributed on other grounds. The goods most obviously in question in my imagined, imagined society are what, what Walzer calls office and honor. And I'm assuming uh, that office and honor are distributed, in fact, according to the appropriate basis. That is, offices are given to those most qualified for them, and esteem is given to those whose developed talents are genuinely valuable and worthy of esteem. What I've not mentioned, however, are what I called earlier associational goods. So we might say that a society of the kind I'm imagining is not objectionable as long as the recognition that goes with positions of advantage doesn't bring with it also greater perceived desirability as a friend, neighbor, marriage partner, or at least to be more realistic, at least as long as those who do not qualify for these positions aren't seen as very ineligible and undesirable for these roles. This su the suggestion is that as long as this evaluative error of transferring admiration for talent over into the denial of associational goods isn't widespread and encouraged in the society, there will be no objectionable status harm involved in the ranking uh, that people uh, assume to apply. The dumb, to use Nagel's harsh phrase, may still be disappointed that, do, that they do not have the abilities that are given special recognition in their society, but that's life. They have no objection to the way they are, in fact, treated if these assumptions and you know, the separation of the goods in Walter's sense is preserved. Another way to put this would be to say that such a society does not involve objectionable differences in status as long as those who do not qualify for positions of advantage don't thereby suffer what Chi called agency poverty. This will be so if the abilities in question aren't seen as precondition for important forms of agency, such as being a good parent, 
being someone whose complaints to a bureaucracy are taken seriously, and someone who can play a full role as a citizen in civic life. This will depend on what Chi calls the standard of normal agency in the society being properly aligned with the capacities of its citizens. The standard of agency not being set so high that many citizens, uh, if, if they haven't got a PhD or whatever, uh, don't really qualify for it. But that seems like a possibility. Related to this, but going beyond it, I believe, is a question of the degree of importance attached to various forms of accomplishment. I said earlier that all parents in the society I was imagining wanted and had reason to want for their children to develop abilities that would qualify them for special positions by getting into the best universities and so on, and that people would all be disappointed if they or their children failed to have these abilities. The question I'm now focusing on is how disappointed it's reasonable for them to be, or in what way they have reason to be disappointed. It's one thing to wish things were otherwise, but something else to be crushed and think one's life a misfortune. Reacting in the latter way would be a new kind, a further kind of what I called earlier evaluative <coughs> error, even if it did not involve believing that this, feeling, that this failing made one unsuitable for associational goods, such as friendship, marriage, neighborliness, and so on. And a society that fostered this kind of error, this kind of excessive excessive attachment of importance to these distinctions would be objectionable on that ground. The point is that even if everyone in the society has reason to wish to have talents qualifying them and their children for certain desirable positions, they also have reason to believe that there are other things worth doing and other lives very much worth living and, and appropriately things that one can be content with. Not to see that this is the case would be an additional evaluative error. And when we think of an ideally meritocratic society as involving an objectionable hierarchy, that may be because we are ourselves committing this evaluative error of assigning too much importance uh, to these distinctions or imagining that the people in the society uh, attach too much importance uh, to, these, uh, to these distinctions. I'm not, certain whether, I'm not certain at all whether that's true, but what does seem to be true is that our reaction to these cases is fundamentally depends on these evaluative judgments and, and on the idea of which of these evaluative judgments make sense and are appropriate. That is, we think it's appropriate to want to have the talents and develop them, but then the question is how, how should one respond to the fact that one doesn't have them? That's an evaluative, an evaluative question rather than a question of justice, and it seems to me that our idea, our judgment about whether a meritocratic society could avoid being something like an objectionable caste society may depend upon our understanding of that evaluative distinction and our estimation of the likelihood that th the appropriate kind of evaluation could be made widespread uh, in a society. I now turn to a second uh, proposal for how to cope uh, with differences of this kind, and this is Rawls's idea of non-comparing groups. Even if a society recognizes certain abilities through positions to which advantages are attached, which is licensed, Rawl says, by his difference principle, and these are positions through which, for which people are chosen under conditions of equality of opportunity, this needn't lead, Rawl says, to a loss of self-respect on the part of people who don't qualify for these positions in, in the society. And this is so in part, he says, because people tend to form what he calls non-comparing groups in which they associate mainly with others of comparable interests and abilities. To protect people against a loss of self-respect, a loss of confidence in the worth of their plans of life and in their ability to carry these plans out, all that is required, he says, or what is required, he says, is that there should be for each person, this is a quote, at least one community of shared interests to which he belongs and where he finds his endeavors confirmed by his associates. Later, he then says, the, pl the plurality of associations in a well-ordered society, each with its secure internal life, tends to reduce the visibility, or at least the painful visibility, of variations in men's prospects. For we tend to compare our circumstances with others in the same or a similar group as us, or in, a position, or, or in positions that we regard as relevant to our aspirations. Right. Now, is this a way of concealing a problem, or is it a solution? It, it would be a way of concealing a problem if what were concealed by, from the people who form non-comparing groups were differences in their standing and other people's standing that were themselves unjust. The point is, rather, that even inequalities that are just may pro provoke regret 
and unhappy comparisons if one's nose is constantly rubbed into them in one's daily life. But, Rawls is imagining, this will not happen if such non-comparing groups arise as they generally do. It should also be said that Rawls seems mainly to be talking about differences in income and wealth, whereas what I've been discussing is in individual sense of failure at turning out to be less good than they have reason to want to be at things that they believe correctly are worth striving for. The shielding effect of non-comparing groups may seem less controversial as a way of dealing with this latter problem arising from evaluative comparisons than it would be as a way of shielding unhappiness due to economic differences. I'm assuming that the economic differences are minimized in order to focus on the, the status-like character of, of the evaluative differences. However, I don't know what the answer to that question is. However one may judge it, it does seem to me that the idea of non-comparing groups is a, a very relevant idea and, and that such groups are a real phenomenon. I want to close by speculating that such groups are relevant in two ways to the explosion of inequality in our own societies. Whatever reasons there may be for objecting to, to this growth in inequality in our societies, which I discussed last time, the idea that the extreme wealth and incomes of the 1% occasions feelings of injured status and loss of self-respect among the rest of us in the 99% seems to me not one of those reasons. Judging for, first from my own experience, I certainly don't feel any shame at the fact that I can't go out in public living in the style to which Donald Trump and others seem to have become accustomed. Perhaps this is just because my life, fortunately, provides me with many supports and reassurance, much reassurance for my own self-respect. So perhaps things are therefore different for those who have much less than I do. About this I can only speculate, but I doubt that it's true. I would speculate that there, if there is inequality in our society that occasions status harms of the kind I've been discussing, it's the inequality between people like us and the people who have much less than we do, in particular those who are truly poor and lack education. These effects may be reduced by the fact that we belong to non-comparing groups, but I doubt that they are significantly erased. It does seem plausible to me, however, that my lack of distress about the difference between my life and that of the super-rich may be due in part to the fact that we do indeed belong to different non-comparing groups. The way they live doesn't make me subject to status poverty or agency poverty because their life doesn't set any norms, sorry, doesn't, doesn't set any norms of, or expectations for me. Nor, I would say, do they set any norms or expectations for those who have less, less than I do. But these ways of living do set a norm for them. And this can have some important effects. I have no desire to have that much money or to have the things that that money can buy that I can't afford. But they, those people, the 1%, apparently do have a desire uh, for that amount of money and for those things. In no small part, I think, because it's what others have to whom they compare themselves. Externally non-comparing groups are the loci of, in, of serious internal comparisons. This is relevant, I think, to the recent growth of inequality, at least in part of which consists in the great increase in compensation of corporate executives. Criticism of the levels of executive compensation in the United States have led to two changes in the practice through which the compensation of corporate executives is generally determined. The first of these is that facts about executives' compensation have, be mu have become much more publicly available through the statements of corporations, uh, their, their proxy uh, materials, uh, and, and, and through the internet, and so on. A second change is that compensation committees at corporations increasingly hire outside consultants to advise them in deciding on the compensation packages for their executives every year. One thing these consultants do is to provide comparables, that is to say, reports of the compensation packages that, that, that other companies that the corporation in question would like to compare itself to assign to their, uh, to their executives. <coughs> now, it might have been hoped that these two changes, greater transparency and the use of outside consultants to avoid the appearance of board members simply favoring their friends, would to some degree slow the growth of executive compensation. 
But the reverse seems to have occurred. And I don't know, I can't tell you anything about causation here, but certainly as correlation, there hasn't been any, there hasn't been any corresponding uh, slowing. And in fact, this was, th this, th these changes were happening during a period of accelerated, uh, accelerated uh, growth in, 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 in compensation. Um, and it seems to me reasonable to speculate that this may be in part because these measures themselves have an escalating effect on compensation. One effect is that the firms compare themselves to other firms that are doing at least as well or better than they are, and they feel that what they offer their executives must at least keep up with what these other firms are offering. Another effect that seems to me likely is that these measures solidify the sense on the part of executives that they deserve these levels of reward or ever greater levels of reward every year um, since they can see the public available facts about what other executives who are doing similar kinds of things are receiving and they take this as a benchmark indicating what people should get for doing the kind of work that they do. This is unsurprising. The idea that they should take this as a basis of dessert seems to me unsurprising given what I said above about the essentially conventional basis of economic desert. That is to say, it's unsurprising that these people would feel this way and feel it strongly. But when we recognize the conventional basis of these judgments, I think it's also clear that those judgments themselves have no moral weight. To summarize, in this lecture I've tried to describe what seems to me objectionable about societies marked by discrimination uh, of various kinds. The evils of such a society involve, I argued, unjustifiable denial of important goods, including what I called associational goods. I noticed that the attitudes prevalent in such societies include the view that the different, these differences in treatment are deserved, and I asserted that desert claims are sometimes justified, as for example in the case of moral blame, but they're not justified in these cases of discrimination, nor, I claimed, can differences in economic reward be justified on grounds of desert. They can be justified only derivatively via a non-desert based justification of the institutions that assign these rewards. Views that certain jobs deserve certain kinds of reward are, I said, are suggested expressions of social convention. I went on to explain how economic inequality can produce status harms like those that are part of societies marked by discrimination. These harms depend not only on economic inequality, but also on prevailing attitudes about the importance of certain goods. The harms thus depend on what I called evaluative errors. I then considered whether similar harms might persist without evaluative error in a society in which there was no discrimination and in fact full equality of opportunity. I considered Rawls's idea of non-comparing groups as a way of avoiding such harms and finally speculated about the role of non-comparing groups in our own societies. I speculated that intra-group comparisons could fuel the growth of inequality and support the sense that these unequal rewards are deserved. In my next lecture, I will turn to the question of equality of opportunity itself and the arguments in favor of it and the difficulties of achieving it. Thank you very much.